Old buildings have a unique way of connecting the past to the present, whether it's through their history or their architecture. And sometimes developers can think of unique ways to keep most of the historical features intact. Architectural historian Jeff Darby recently visited with two brothers who did just that. They reimagined an old school into a mixed use space for the community. We head to the open air school building off Neal Avenue to get the story. We're on the north side of the city, on Neal Avenue, north of Ohio State University, in a neighborhood that's kind of tucked away that uh, not necessarily a lot of people know about. We're going to visit a really interesting school building. It's a property known as the Open Air School, that's its historic name, and we're going to find out just what's happened to it uh, in the recent past. Ben. Jeff, how you doing? Good to see you, Michael. Good to see you. Jeff, welcome. Thanks so much. So the open air school. Yes. What a, a wonderful place this is. Uh, the architecture on the exterior is wonderful. So tell me about the place. When was it built? How was it used? It was built in 1928 and it was called the open air school. It was a school that was built for kids that were predisposed to tuberculosis. And at the time they thought that kids needed plenty of fresh air, rest, and um, exercise in order to prevent them from getting tuberculosis. That was a real problem in, in the early 20th century, wasn't it? It was. At its peak, uh, one in every seven deaths were from tuberculosis. Well, w once you got farther into the 20th century and they figured out how to treat tuberculosis, I'm assuming it, it sort of lost that original purpose. In the 40s, uh, tuberculosis had pretty much uh, been eradicated, and so at that time they transitioned it to a, a school for kids with physical disabilities and also a neighborhood school. And it was that until the 70s um, when it became administrative offices for the school district. Okay, so they used it as offices, and then at some point you got interested in it. How did that come about? So when the, uh, the public schools come across a building that they no longer can use, it first goes to other schools in the area, universities, and they have the opportunity to buy it. If no one wants to buy it, then they take it to a public auction. So developers like Michael and I could go in and sit in a classroom at the public schools and, and bid on this school. So that's how this school came about, it was through a public auction. Well, based on what I've been seeing, a full parking lot, plenty of activity in the restaurant area, shops open, offices in use, it looks like you've made the right choice and, and redeveloped it in the right way. I'd love to see more of the building. Can I yeah, we'd love to show you. This is the original hallway, and what you see on the walls as far as the brick and on the floor with the tile, this is all original. And the lockers, too, I know. Lockers as well. That's great. We preserved all that. And this is restaurant seating, but it reminds me of the desks I used to sit at when I was in grade school. Yes, yeah, we tried to bring that in. I'm a little older than you guys, so it was, <laughs> it was not easy sitting. Right. And these, these actually used to be lockers along here, but we tried to figure out a way, how do we bring more people and activity into a hallway? And so we decided to bring seating out into the hallway. In this space right over here, the cafe used to be a play area. Before those windows were put in, it was all open, so it was just columns. The open air covered. concept, fresh exactly. air, sunlight, but, but sheltered from the rain, that sort of thing. That's right. I noticed too that, you know, this is so school-like still with, with the stencil, stencil words and numbers over the doorways. And those stencil numbers, um, we've changed the numbers, but the style is exactly yeah, what we found when we came in here. I'd like to show you one of the old classrooms. It's pretty cool. Let's have a look. Oh yeah, this is, this is one of those great spaces that I'm always hoping to see when I go to a historic building. So this is the lounge uh, that is done by Understory. Understory is a sister concept of Wolf's Ridge, which is located downtown. So they did a great job and it's a beautiful space in here. It really is. The, the exposed brick walls are all original. There yes. really wasn't any plaster on the walls to speak of. That's right. Yeah, this is one of four classrooms. There's two on this first floor and then two on the second. And you can see all these big windows, and that was in line with the concept of having as much sunlight, much open air and fresh air. And they also thought the cold air was important. So even in the winter, they would have all these windows open, and the kids would be in Eskimo jackets. <laughs> and they thought that was important, but they, um, the floors had radiant heat. 
hot water running through the floors, and that kept the kids at least a little bit warmer. So um, this, this tenant design, designed the space in cooperation with you. When we first bought this building, we were trying to figure out what would be the best uses for each space. Mm -hmm. So we envisioned this being the bar and the lounge. Uh, we envisioned the space below being the restaurant. So when we found Wolf's Ridge and they were very interested in this space, they were able to come in and bring on their design team to help create this and actually make it come to life. Well, I know there's more to see if you have other spaces you'd care to show me. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go show you. Lead the way. Jeff, welcome to the event space. Oh boy, another wonderful space. Big arch windows, this is great. Um, so it's an event space. What was it originally? This was originally the restroom. So there were pictures that we found back when it was the open air school. There, there were kids on cots in their Eskimo suits. And this is where they would come for nap time. Uh, the resting room. Yes. But not the restroom. Gotcha. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yep. And you can see out the window um, is the Ontangi River. And that was intentional. They, they built this school because they wanted it to be a, a spot where there'd be plenty of fresh air and not close to industry or other sources of pollution. And at the time, this was outside the city, so this was far, far away from where... Yeah, it was well outside, I'm mm -hmm. sure. And it looks like there's a deck outside. Is that accessible from this level? We call that the terrace, and we use it now for the event space, but they also used it back then as a play area for the kids. And you can still see the historic piping along the walls from as part of the heating system. I assume that's not operating right now. That's right, it's not. We, we have all new mechanical systems, and that was one of the heavy lifts we had to do as part oh, of the sure. renovation. Well, there must be other spaces we haven't seen yet. Yeah, let's go. All right. So another great space. We're in the basement, but clearly it was a, a, a busy space. And what was this? This was actually the cafeteria. So kids would come down these stairs and they would queue up in line along here to the serving windows that you can see at the end oh, of yeah, the Yeah, I can see the, the windows, space. right. And they're, well, it's kind of a cafeteria now because that's where you pick up your food. Correct, yeah, this is now the restaurant space uh, for understory. So all we're missing is the kids. That's right, that's right. And the best part is right through that door, uh, amazing terrace. Yes, let's go have a look at that. I've, I've heard about that, I'd like to see it. Well, this is a special outdoor space, uh, and, it, and it's um, an original space for the building. Yes, it was one of the outdoor play areas, they called it the other terrace. And um, yeah, it looked very similar to this when we bought it. We've um, obviously done some improvements and cleaned it up, but this was very much an outdoor space overlooking the Olentangy River. Then you really get a sense of all the, the way all the different materials in the building were put together. The cut stone, the, the rough stone, the brick, the, the terracotta trim. It really is a kind of an architectural lesson as well. The style of architecture is Italian Renaissance Revival. And it's got some interesting characteristics. I'm sure you know many of them. One of my favorites is how the brickwork is intentionally off kilter. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's all the brick on the outside is like that. They don't make buildings like, like this anymore, especially the back side of a building. It's, it's beautiful back here. And you're, you're only a block off High Street, but you feel like you're moved and much further off of High Street based on where how close we are to the Old Tandy Trail. Well, taking on a project like this must have had its scary moments now and then. Fortunately, there weren't too many major issues that came up during the construction of this process. It went smoothly uh, for a historic building of this nature. The building is very solid. As you can see with the brickwork, we didn't have to do much tuck pointing at all, if any, and the building was built very soundly. Like you said, a project like this was, was stressful at times, but uh, at the end of the day, to complete something like this and, and breathe new life into an old building and keep it going for hopefully another hundred years, it's very fulfilling for us. Well, it sounds like you've really, you, you really understand the importance of preserving historic places like this and how they communicate to the character of the community. It's a lot more work than something new out in the suburbs, but uh, it's, also, it's also more rewarding for just the reasons you've been citing. Yeah. So thanks so much for the tour. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, it. Jeff. And, Thank you, uh, Jeff. Good luck in the future. Thank you.
When you think about it, bridges not only connect destinations, they can also link generations. The Hope Memorial Bridge in Cleveland is a good example. Next, our partners at the Ohio History Connection got the story behind the iconic guardian pylons that are sculpted onto this historic bridge. I'm David Simmons, author of the article on Cleveland's Guardians, and I'm interested in telling you a little bit more about this unique structure. I'm Bill Eichenberger, and I'm the editor of the Ohio History Connections membership publication, Echoes Magazine. What interests me about the story is the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge uh, is really emblematic of Cleveland in the 20th century the highs of the 1920s and 30s, the lows of the 1970s and 80s, and now uh, in a new century, uh, the, the guardians sort of watch over the city. Public art is something that people uh, have strong feelings about, but in this case, these are such monumental additions uh, that they're like nothing else in the state, they're so unique that they really need to be preserved and that's what makes them special to me. Henry Ford was the one that came up with the idea of everyone owning an automobile and Cleveland got a factory for Ford in 1914. So as a result, Cleveland's streets were full of automobiles. The whole history of the automobile in this country is the roads desperately trying to catch up to the automobile. <laughs> the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge was all about getting traffic over the flats. The flats is a warehouse and industrial area right in the middle of the city. Throughout the 1920s, Cleveland was so committed to the future and progress that they decided that they wanted to build this Lorraine Carnegie Bridge. The bridge was a collaboration between an engineer and an architect. Wilbur Watson was the engineer and he was very interested in bridge architecture and hired Frank Walker to help him design and make the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge appealing and attractive by adding these guardians that were holding different modes of transportation in their hands. In the 1970s, we saw the beginning of uh, the decline of the steel industry in northeastern Ohio. Uh, at the same time, we were seeing the deterioration of the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge. De-icing was one of the main factors. These Ohio winters were just brutal. Actually had to close the sidewalks, close two of the outside lanes, and then all the while the air pollution was darkening the guardians themselves to the point that they looked shabby and, and worn out. The bridge survived the 1970s, and by the early 1980s, the city uh, was going to rehabilitate it. Through the historic preservation processing, they were saved, but they also agreed to clean all the years of grime and dirt off the, off the pylons. The soot had turned these Art Deco pylons from more of a beige color to, to, to black. The technicians that were doing that agreed to leave one bit of darkened stone and that was the the coal in the in the bed of the coal truck they thought this should stay black just because that's more realistic when i first heard that the indians were changing their name to the guardians i was indifferent about the name uh, at best and then i read an article that quoted paul dolan the indians owner saying that he rode his bicycle from his office of progressive field across the bridge every day and he said that even though the name came without consideration of the guardians that it makes perfect sense for the city 
Now the only question is whether or not the Guardians can help the team protect an eighth or ninth inning lead. <laughs>Green chilies, this is too hot. If you don't want the hot, if you want the mild, you might don't want to use this. We have uh, ginger, and we have to chop this up. Okay. We cut it from here. So is this a really popular dish? Yeah, it's very popular. If you ask even a like, five years old baby, they know what this is, so. Okay, <laughs> started from it's birth. Very, yep. And from Nepali Bhutanese culture? Yeah, mostly mm -hmm. Nepali Bhutanese. Okay. Now we chop the onion a little bit longer because it goes uh, like mixed up with the vegetable pretty quick and it looks good on it. So is this something that a typical Nepali Bhutanese household, everyone would know how to cook this dish as well? Yes, pretty much. This is like mother's dish. Okay. If you don't want to use this, you do not because this is pretty hot, so okay. spicy. But you typically use it? Oh yes, we like, we like spicy dishes. Uh, for the ginger, we gonna have to smash this up with this thing. Okay. This thing is very popular in Nepal. It's in every house they have this to even for you know for the all kind of ingredients, spices. They smash it so we can have a little pretty uh, good flavor. So I'm gonna have. So I have the ginger ready here. Okay, I'm gonna put this on the plate and we are ready to cook. And I have uh, vegetable oil here. Okay. We're gonna use this oil for the pan. All right. Got mustard greens on the plate. The red chili, dried red chili peppers. Put the onions with the... Yeah, with the garlic. We can put this one right here. Okay, now we have all of our ingredients ready and we are ready to cook. And we are cooking like two more dishes. We are having the lentil soup and we're gonna cook the goat curry masala. Okay. It's like goat meat. It's very good, very famous. Goat meat is amazing, oh, yep. Yes. And let's go, would you mind to hold those two Absolutely. Places? Thank you. Okay. Here we have our safe pasta. Pasta, yes. He's gonna show I'm you how to cook all this food and he's gonna mix up the ingredients and make it look so tasty. Tasty, yeah, very good. All right. So, you ready? I'm ready. Good. Are you ready? Right. Okay. So, Hasta, will you talk about where did you learn how to make this dish? When was the first time you made it? You are my country. He learned it from his own country, Nepal. Okay. How old were you when you started making it? He was like, you know, 2025. Goat, 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 meat here. Goat, goat, goat curry masala, and he's gonna make the lentil. Dal, lentil. Okay. A little bit of chopped tomato. Goat, what kind of masala? The goat 
curry is a little bit half cooked. So it, it's already marinated with uh, all the spices and okay. herbs. What spices and herbs? Look, what is it? Masala. Masala? Jeera. Cumin seed. Cumin seed. Grind, it, it grind the cumin seed. Yes, and it's dried on it. And it's also a little bit of a little bit of a little uh, like bay leaves, cumin seeds, oh, uh, oh, mori, uh, the peppers, black Pan peppers, peppers. Uh, panel seed, panel seed, uh, fenugreek, fenugreek. grind it all, on. mix it all. Okay. How long do you marinate the meat? Kati kati versa ma masala marinate kar rakhnu parsa. Masala alag kati versa rakhnu parsa. Oh, dead gone. Like one and a half hour. Okay. At least in the cooler. Okay. And wow, look at the sauce that just came up too. Yeah. There's a bunch of soup. Yeah, soup. he add a little bit of water on it. So. Now he's going to top up some uh, more flavor. Uh, that one is a Kashmiri chili powder. Okay. That gives you a little bit of authentic flavor uh, and the salt for the taste you like. It gives a color too. Mm. Awesome. Ready. Oh, done. The goat curry is ready. Okay. okay. What are we making next? What are we making next? Dal. Now he's going to cook the lentil soup. Okay. Is everything ready? It looks ready. Yep, it's ready. Okay, let's eat then. Okay. You ready for the food? I'm ready. Are you ready? Uh, yes. I okay, think here I'm is the here. food. Oh, oh my gosh. This looks gorgeous. Thank you. Yeah. And Dora, this is my partner, uh, Narayan. Narayan, nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Dora. Okay. All right. Yeah, let's see. eat. Okay. So just like sharing the food, mm -hmm. you can put it on a plate. Thank you. You're welcome. Usually you can eat it from here too. This is a serving plate. Okay. But if you prefer to eat in a different plate, you can do that too. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. This is very yummy. Mm. This is so flavorful. Oh, really thank you. Yeah. This is great. So, can you tell me more about this business? How did you guys get started, and when? Well, um, as an Nepali and British uh, cultures, like we have very rich uh, history of culinary, and then we feel the the absence of the authentic. Nepali Indian restaurant in this area, mm -hmm. and uh, we feel like it's a need here, so yeah, we choose this place and open the. So we were talking about how goat tali is kind of an everyday dish that people like. Can you talk about why is this a reason to celebrate? Maybe. It's it's just not only the goat tali; it's the tali itself. Because mm -hmm. the thali, like we have the so different kind of tali. We got the vegetable, chicken, goat. Okay. So like as a Nepali and Bhutanese peoples, like we don't ha eat like heavy breakfast. Pretty much like on the breakfast, we just do like tea, coffee, stuff, but we don't eat like a real breakfast. So the lunch and the dinner is our heavy meal. This is what we eat in our daily basis. But the lentil, the rice, uh, the vegetables, curries. We have a vitamin, we yeah. have a carbs, yeah. we have protein. Yeah. <laughs> so All in one. Mix up everything. Yeah. So. That's perfect. Yeah. One hit wonder. You got everything you need, right? <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that you guys are located in Reynoldsburg because there's really a huge rise in the Nepali Bhutanese population yeah. here. So are you seeing that impact how many people come to your restaurant? You even have the first Nepali Bhutanese elected official in America who lives here. We provide the campaign for them too. Like Buwan, like he's the first city council elected from our community. And then we are very, very honored to to give him the, the, venue. the venue here. Yeah. The, Bhutanese population is like more than 25,000 now and then like this is a great place for them to to have their authentic Nepali Indian food too and it's just not only for the Nepali community like we're serving the others. When we first opened the business we were quite expected to see you know like if uh, the American people like our food or not because the Indian food has been popular in the U.S. for so many decades mm -hmm. but we like quite a surprise that they how people like us and then accept us. The the community, the neighborhood here, they are very supporting to us. And you know they just started loving it, trying our food, they spread their words to their friends and families. 
we don't just share food to them. Like we share our cultures too. Uh, we sit together, so we share our cultures, we talk about us, like we talk about our Nepali, the, the culture, Nepali yeah. and the Vietnamese uh, cultures to them, and they are pretty excited to hear that and like, you know, like hear our stories. So we share a lot of our cultures along with the food. Thank you guys for bringing me here. It's yeah. been really great to learn thank about you, Sargon. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so for much. giving us yeah. opportunity to present our food. Absolutely. <laughs>